Good day to everyone from Washington, D.C. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome from the Africa Center for Strategic Studies to alumni, colleagues, friends, and partners from over 60 countries across the African continent and the world we have registered for today's webinar entitled Artificial Intelligence and the African Security Landscape. My name is Nate Allen, and I am an Associate Professor of Security Studies here at the Africa Center. I am the Africa Center's faculty lead on cyber and emerging technology issues. The format for today's webinar is a moderated discussion with our two panelists, followed by a question and answer session with the participants of today's webinar. During the question and answer portion of the webinar, please use the chat function to submit your written questions for the panelists. You may submit your questions in any language that you would like. And as moderator, I will convey as many questions to our panelists as our time will allow. A reminder to everyone that this webinar is on the record. It will be recorded and posted under our programs tab on our website and used as educational material. Um, if you require any technical support, once again, please do not hesitate to use the chat function on the menu at the bottom of your screen. The Africa Center staff will respond to your technical questions directly on the chat line. And before we continue with today's program, it is my honor to turn things over to the Deputy Director of the Africa Center, uh, Daniel Colonel Dan Hampton, to say a few words about the center. Dan, over to you. Okay, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you're connecting from. And thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and for your interest in this program. As Dr. Allen mentioned, my name is Daniel Hampton, and I'm the Deputy Director for the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I know we have a lot of alumni who have registered and participating today, and you may know the Africa Center, but we also have a lot of new people as well. So let me just give a brief refresher on who we are and what we do. So the Africa Center was established by the United States Congress in 1999 for the study of security issues relating to Africa and serving as a forum for research, communication, and exchange of ideas. And to achieve this mandate we have from our Congress, we developed the following mission statement, to advance African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. We are organized around three pillars within the Africa Center to execute this mission. The first is our academic affairs section, and they organize seminars, workshops, symposium, webinars, events like we have today. Second is our research and strategic communications. If you're not familiar with our website, africacenter.org, I would strongly encourage you to make it part of your normal routine. We have a wealth of material there, not only all the program information and videos that Dr. Allen mentioned where this webinar will be posted, all the publications that the Africa Center produces, mostly authored by African authors, are posted there in English and French, uh, many in Portuguese, some in Arabic, uh, just a wealth of information that is africacenter.org. Our third pillar is our Community Alumni Partnerships and Engagement Division, and they're responsible for the building and sustaining those enduring partnerships I spoke about in our mission statement. So more than just your participation in this event, we value the continued relationship we have with larger extended Africa Center family throughout the continent and with all our stakeholders around the world. So thank you for joining us today. We're really pleased to offer this webinar today. Uh, the interest in AI uh, as an emerging technology and particularly its impact and opportunities and threats or challenges in the security sector seem to be on everyone's mind. Registration for this webinar was our highest ever of any webinar we've been doing uh, in the past three years, which shows the interest. Another data point, we recently hosted a uh, African Council of Commandants for commandants from PME institutions across Africa. And you, 
The commandants repeatedly highlighted the need to better understand AI within the realm of professional military education. So this topic's very important. I'm looking forward to getting into the panelist discussions and then the question and answer afterwards. So again, thanks for joining us. Dr. Allen, thank you for organizing this important event and back to you to kick things off. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. Let's get right to it. In today's digital age, the transformational power of artificial intelligence is undeniable. It holds the promise of driving innovation, revolutionizing industries, and improving the lives of millions across the African continent. Yet within the contours of this remarkable progress lie profound security challenges that demand our careful consideration. As we delve into the security implications of AI for Africa, we encounter a complex tapestry of challenges. The proliferation of AI-driven algorithms has given rise to an era where dis disinformation can spread like wildfire, disrupt social harmony, fracture trust in institutions, and undermine the very foundations of our democratic processes. The emergence of AI-enabled unmanned systems and armed conflict marks a profound shift in the nature of warfare. And as AI becomes increasingly intertwined with military operations, we must address critical issues of accountability, transparency, and the preservation of human dignity, especially in the context of Africa's diverse security challenges. If you would like further evidence that we may be at an inflection point where computer-based intelligence does in some important respects rival and even surpasses human intelligence, then consider the following. The previous minute or so of this introduction was written with the assistance of OpenAI's ChatGPT, which I prompted me to write a two to three minute introduction to a, a quote, webinar on the security implications of artificial intelligence for Africa. Uh, I'm pasting the prompt that I used in the chat and if you are curious, I encourage you to sign up for ChatGPT. Uh, if you'd like, the link to sign up is right here below. So for the rest of this webinar, at least, we will be relying on human expertise to further demystify this important topic for us. And I think you'll agree that our two distinguished panelists are far more qualified, capable, and well-suited well to illuminate for us the security implications and challenges of advances in artificial intelligence for Africa for now than any modern AI chatbot. So without further ado, first we have joining us uh, Ms. Nokthula Olarunju. She is an attorney and researcher based in South Africa, and she is part of the Global Index on Responsible AI and the AI 4D African Observatory on Responsible AI Teams. She has published widely on issues of gender equality, human rights, and responsible and ethical artificial intelligence, and judiciary in the global south. We also have with us a Mr. Abdul Hakim Ajijola, who is chair of the African Union Cybersecurity Expert Group. He is a leading professional in the technology industry. He ranked number one on the IFSEC 2020 Global Cybersecurity Professional Influencers and Thought Leaders list, and he serves on a number of multilateral bodies, including as a commissioner at the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace and a resource to the United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs. We are absolutely delighted to have the two of you with us today. Nokthula, we're going we're gonna to start with you. Um, I think it's important to start with the basics for those of us who are new to this topic. Some of us, for example, might hear the term artificial intelligence and think of all-knowing computer systems or humanoid robots we read about or see depicted in science fiction movies. So tell us, what exactly is artificial intelligence and what are the capabilities and limitations of current AI-powered technologies. Nakthula, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Nate. Uh, thank you for this opportunity as well. Um, 
let me start off by saying perhaps that there is no agreed definition for artificial intelligence right now. And I think that is the basis of a lot of contention around the issue of AI. If you cannot define it, how do you regulate it or how do you deal with it? But if we take it back to uh, what is referred to as the founding fathers of AI, uh, John McCarthy McCath and uh, Minsky, they gave a general understanding of AI as something that is a machine or a computer that can repl replicate human intelligence. And this was building on the work of um, Alan Turing and um, Isaac Asimov with the law of robotics. But essentially AI is in its name. It's, it's, it's computers, it's machines that replicate human intelligence in whatever way you know, that can be done. And I often use this anecdote with my colleagues. Uh, whenever you read an article about AI, whenever you join a discussion on AI, two phrases tend to come up. The first one is, AI is ubiquitous. Now, every time you hear that, you take a sip of water. Now, it can either keep you very healthy, or if you're taking a sip of coffee, it can keep you up the whole day. But the second phrase is, data is the new oil. And as cliche as they often sound, there's truth in, in those two statements, in that AI is not new. AI started back in the 1950s. And unfortunately, AI's proliferation and its exponential growth has only been seen in the last give or take decade or two decades. But AI, AI has gone through cycles. And when AI is not growing, it was referred to as the AI winter. But because there has been a growth of data, there has been an increase in computational processing power. We now have what we have right now. We now have, you know, a massive interest in things like chat GPT, in, you know, in algorithms, in, in, in data hubs or big data, if a lot, as a lot of people know it. But again, I'll emphasize the definition is not too clear. And it's also posed a difficulty in terms of regulation. I'll use the example of the European Union's AI Act. And it offers a definition there, but that definition in and of itself is apprehensive, if I could put it that way. Um, if I just go to how they've chosen to define AI, it's, here it is. And I encourage everybody to look at that act. And it mentions issues of security in Article 15. Uh, okay, here it is. The definition offered by the European Union speaks to, apologies. Oh, I just had it with me. But anyway, the AI, uh, the definition given in EU relies heavily again on tools or machines that replicate human intelligence, but then it's not definitive, it's vague. So, I mean, two, going back to the second part of your questions, the limitations of AI that we have right now is that it's still largely unknown. You're, we're discovering it as we go along, but there are broad categories of AI. You have narrow artificial intelligence, which is what we've had lately until we move to the second category, which is generative AI, which is what ChatGPT is based on, natural language processing. And finally, the third alpha is super intelligence or singularity. And for many of our uh, audience members, as you know, when you read on AI, you would hear most of what we read about is on narrow artificial intelligence and talks about issues of nar uh, natural language processing, machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, robotics, expert systems, fuzzy logic. These are just brief categories that AI falls into. And we see this with uh, chats, uh, ro robot chats. We see it with Sophia. If you guys remember Sophia from, I think, the UAE or Middle East. We see it with ChatGPT, as Alan, uh, sorry, as Nancy just mentioned. 
but these are the broad categories of AI that we have right now. Uh, Nate, I think I've answered most of your question. I hope I have not missed one part. No, thank you very, very much. No, that was very, very comprehensive. And I particularly like the point about, you know, AI has been around for over 50 years. It's been steadily advancing for a long time. And maybe what is new and different is we've gone from having AI be good at very narrow and specific tasks like mm -hmm. image recognition, language processing, some elements of, of gaming to having to start to have what is called general artificial intelligence that can sort of seemingly reason and come to answers that mimic human intelligence on its own. So this, this advancement of AI has many technologists concerned that we may be at a critical juncture and that the consequences of allowing AI to continue to advance in the absence of safety protocols could be quite profound and destabilizing. Um, recently, I think about six months ago, over 1,000 leading technology experts and CEOs signed a letter calling for a temporary pause on the development of AI, and they said that advanced AI could, quote, represent a profound change in the history of life and earth, and that human competitive intelligence can pose profound risks to society and humanity. So do you think, do you think this is right on, a little bit exaggerated? Um, what in your view broadly are the potential benefits of artificial intelligence, and as well as the harms associated with it that these experts seem so concerned about? Um, I'm glad you asked this question because the first thing one tends to, or I tend to emphasize is that AI is not inherently good or bad. Um, there is a middle ground that can be reached. And the scare around artificial intelligence is because of the proliferation of the harms that we see being caused through the use of AI. And these harms are you know, in part due to issues of social manipulation, uh, the indiscriminate use of you know, data, the violation of privacy, and the exploitation of human rights. I mean, when you think of well-known cases like the, the Compass system that was you know, released and talked about, and Compass, for, for those who did, uh, are not aware of it, was an AI tool system that was used to you know, determine recidivism amongst uh, offenders. And the outcome was that was that the bias was shown towards offenders of color or more biased than those who were, you know, white. But it, it, it boils down to the safety and security issues that are caused when AI is allowed to run free, when AI is not regulated. It's, it, it exists, it currently exists in a legal gray area, and the law is not able to keep up with the growth in AI. So you have bias, you have the exploitation of vulnerable groups. This is on the bad side of AI now. You have social scoring wherein you know a woman is not granted or is given a higher you know premium amount for her insurance than a man would where and more in the security space you have issues of mass surveillance and issues of automated weapons and the use of drones in you know during warfare now on the opposite side of the spectrum AI is being used for good. AI is being used in helping, you know, in the medical field. For instance, um, there's a group in Nigeria that uses AI to get uh, blood to rural areas. AI is being used in certain hospitals in Rwanda for care, uh, patient care, and even for, you know, climate protection. I've worked with colleagues who have started using AI for plant production. Uh, protecting food production, sorry, in Africa, because poverty is still a huge issue in many countries. As the population grows, do we have enough food to feed everyone? So AI can be used to help deal with the bread and butter issues, but AI can equally be used to create threats to human rights, to national security. It just depends on how it's being used. And so we have to reach a point where we have a happy medium 
in a safe space where there are boundaries. If you think of AI as a child, for those parents who are in the room, when your child is young, you know, you have boundaries. You don't do this, you don't do that. As your child grows and develops, the boundaries slowly come, you know, become limited until they themselves are an adult and are able to function on their own. I think that's how we should look at it. We need to find a happy medium that addresses and mitigates the harms caused by artificial intelligence, but enhances the benefits and the opportunities created by artificial intelligence. So that, that would be my response to that. I think that is a great point. You know, as you point out, uh, AI is neither inherently good nor bad, and that a lot of the attention we see given to AI right now is because some of the harms that it is causing are kind of going unchecked. So I think it's clear that a lot rides on what happens next. So given that we have a lot of government and security sector actors from across Africa in the audience, um, I'd like to ask your thoughts on where is this middle ground that you, you talked about uh, just now? What role specifically do you see for government and security sector actors playing in addressing some of the harms spreading from uh, the proliferation of AI, maybe both now, but also potentially as AI advances into the future? And I'll start with this, maybe I'm biased because I'm a lawyer, but I think regulation and policy and laws play a huge role in creating the boundaries I discussed earlier on, in, in, in asserting the middle ground. But even as I mentioned that, um, I have to disclose or I have to, to emphasize, and I'm sure Mr. Ajijala will also talk about this, but creating laws that are context specific. Um, if we use the example of the data protection laws that we have now, what happened was, you know, we uh, a lot of African countries and countries in the global south had some measure of the protection of privacy in their constitutions, in their legal frameworks. And then it almost seemed to happen overnight. Uh, the European Union essentially walks into the room with the GDPR, drops it on the table, walks out of the room and says, all other countries have to comply with this. And what are the implications of non-compliance? They're economic sanctions. I mean, you know, economic implications. They are security implications. So we do not want the same thing to happen with AI laws. At the forefront of AI regulation right now is again, the European Union. And um, to a certain extent, the US and even China now, what we don't want in the global South context is a copy and paste of laws. That doesn't give us a happy medium. That doesn't help the man and the woman on the ground to, you know, how does this law help them? But when we continue or when we choose to create AI laws that are context specific to Africa, context specific to, you know, uh, South America, then we have effective laws that help us reach that middle ground. Now, for the security experts in the room, they have, you have pool, you have, you are in the rooms, you are within spaces that allow you to have conversations that bring to the forefront, let's not just copy and paste a law from somewhere else that doesn't really help us in the long run. Let us, uh, let African countries develop a set of principles and you know, rules or legal frameworks that, that help achieve the middle ground of AI without stifling innovation. One of three, a few examples I can think of is the African Union is developing an AI continental strategy. Now this document is, is, is being drafted. I think the first draft was circulated. Um, things like that, I mean, uh, security strategists can ask, have you considered what the implications of you know, national security would be in, in the strategy? When uh, the, the most recent principal document that uh, comes to mind is the UNESCO recommendation on ethical AI. It has been you know, uh, signed by a number of countries, I think 100 and something, 70 something, if I'm not mistaken, but those principles set a basis for which 
legal frameworks can be built because the recommendation emphasizes human rights. It emphasizes having a human being in the loop, meaning having a human being who can account. It emphasizes transparency. It emphasizes, you know, accountability and explainability. Because more often than not, when you want when you want options, if your rights have been violated by AI, you ask yourself, what legal right or recourse do I have? And when there's nothing there, then what? You know, and more and more, because of the harms caused by AI, you have people saying, then what? And it falls on the judiciary to create common law, you know, and that is not always useful. So I would encourage the specialists in the rooms to make their voices known, to, to, to you know, discuss and talk about how having automated or, you know, decision-making in, in warfare, automated we weapons, who, at the end of the day, who, who, where does the buck stop? Who takes accountability? If a drone is used to attack another country and it's, you know, it's, it's facilitated by artificial intelligence, who bears responsibility? Is it the country? Is it the manufacturer? You know, those are the questions that we should ask. But I would say advocate for responsible AI practices, for ethical AI practices through the principles that exist now, through the legislation that is being built in different countries, and make it context specific. There is no perfect answer, but we can learn from what we see around us. And, and I think that's where I'll, 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 I'll leave it. Thanks, Nate. Thank you, Nathula, for that excellent answer. So for those of you who are, are curious, Nathula referenced the UNESCO Principles on Ethical AI that is linked among the readings in the course. I'll, I'll drop that in the chat um, in a second. But I also think she made a great point about the deed not to just copy and paste uh, AI regulations from abroad. Um, there are so many context-specific challenges um, she mentioned and another another uh, participant has mentioned the issue, for example, of bias, where a lot of AI algorithms are trained on uh, data produced largely by wealthy countries that are predominantly white or Asian. And that being a problem when you're thinking about kind of applying AI and using it in an African context. So so lots to think about there. So Nokula, I think you've you've done a fantastic job of giving us a broad overview of what AI is, what AI technologies are, and some of the challenges associated with it. I'd now like to turn to you, uh, Abdul Hakim, to help us understand the security implications. Um, to my knowledge, there has been little, if any, active discussion by Africa-based experts and uh, practitioners and this is particularly discordant because I think the security implications of AI is something that is of great concern to the rest of the world. You know, the implications of advances in AI for armed um, conflict and warfare are being quite actively debated and discussed. And this, this strikes me as, as a bit odd that there is, from what I've seen, relatively little discussion in Africa, given that so many parts of Africa are experiencing armed conflict. So, uh, Abdul Hakim, uh, in your view, how is artificial intelligence affecting peace and security across Africa right now? And what role do you see it playing in the future? Um, hola to Dubai. Bonjour. Salam alaikum. Good day. Uh, thank you to the African Center uh, and many unsung heroes and heroines who have made this event possible. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, uh, according to uh, Microsoft's Kate Crawford, AI is neither artificial nor is it intelligent. Uh, it's made from natural resources. Um, it, it is people who develop the algorithms, uh, you know, uh, uh, also develop the programming um, and, you know, that perform the tasks that make these systems appear to be autonomous. And so one would argue that artificial intelligence in its current form is not a replacement for human intelligence, uh, empathy, uh, intuition, genius, you know, and, and so on. And so, it, it, you know, it's pattern recognition, uh, which is actually something that's been around for thousands of years. And so AI is actually made up from, you know, a vast amount of natural resources, especially energy. 
in, in the form of fuel and uh, human labor. And so it's not intelligent in any kind of human intelligence way. Uh, and it is you know, a completely different statistical logic uh, for how meaning is made. And so you know, there have been many vendors that claim to do AI, but really one would argue they're not doing more, anything more than big data analytics and pretending that it's AI. And so there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in the industry. And this is why we must make sure that as we are working on our solutions, uh, we are not necessarily vendor driven. So back to the issues at hand. Uh, there's a, an Egyptian proverb that says, a beautiful thing is never perfect. And I think this encapsulates the, the notion uh, of the challenges of AI in the context of peace and security. Uh, we see a lot of emerging technologies that leverage AI, and certainly AI is driving a revolution across the world, but in this context, the African continent. And we, we see emerging technologies such as CCT cameras with facial recognition systems that underpin surveillance technologies, uh, which in some cases, and I think uh, Nokosula actually touched on this, um, you know, these, these technologies do have the powers uh, to provide new tactics for repression. Uh, we also see drones uh, that can scan uh, the ground, um, you know, to, see, to, to sift through for changes uh, maybe due to the movement of uh, bandits or insurgents or terrorists, uh, you know, through a particular vicinity. And so while this is a very useful and, and necessary thing, these same drones can unleash the prospect of uh, an autonomous weapons uh, systems arms race. Uh, we also see uh, the emergence of sophisticated malwares that uh, enable novel forms of, of criminality. And so we're also seeing uh, emerging uh, technologies as having, or that they will have, uh, you know, quite a significant impact on the security and stability of African states. And some examples uh, that we, we believe are already happening. Uh, for example, in the area of surveillance and monitoring, uh, countries like Tunisia are already using drones with uh, AI algorithms for border surveillance. Uh, to prevent smuggling and illegal crossings. Uh, we're also seeing data analytics for predictive policing. Uh, in the city of Johannesburg, South Africa, police are using uh, automated license plate, plate readers uh, to enable those authorities to track violent and um, uh, organized criminal elements. And we also see that the combination of AI predictive analytics um, is able to help the police identify potential hotspots, uh, you know, slightly before they become hotspots. Uh, so that's part of the predictive uh, policing. Uh, we're also seeing its application in cybersecurity. We see a number of firms, for example, in uh, cybersecurity firms in Nigeria that are using machine learning algorithms to detect patterns in cyber attacks and, you know, endeavor to protect them uh, or to prevent them proactively. Um, we're also seeing in the area of human assistance, and I think again, uh, Uncle Thula mentioned or alluded to that. Uh, in uh, I think in Liwande National Park, which is in Malawi, uh, the park rangers employ uh, Earth Ranger software to combat poaching using artificial intelligence and predictive analytics. And uh, I thank Nate and some of his colleagues for the great article uh, recently in the Brookings Institution that touches on some of this. Uh, but when we talk about the Earth Ranger software, for example, it actually identifies patterns in poaching that rangers might overlook. And this includes increased poaching, for example, during holidays and government uh, paydays when they've gone to try and collect their, their wages. And so they've deployed, for example, a, a motion activated uh, poacher cam, uh, basically a camera uh, that's equipped with an algorithm to differentiate between human and animal movement. And at least this has led to uh, one arrest. So it's, it's the beginning of that process. We've also seen um, AI powered drones that are deployed to evaluate the impact of natural disasters and assess the requirements of affected areas. Um, and so, you know, this is in the, um, um, after, for example, nat natural disasters. Now we must note here that most African states now possess at a minimum 
a cyber unit responsible for monitoring and responding to cyber crime, and they are beginning to deploy uh, uh, systems that leverage AI. We're also seeing governments across the globe that have developed uh, national cybersecurity defense strategies uh, that incorporate some kind of AI uh, capability or platform uh, to combat the various uh, cybersecurity risks that their citizens and buildings, I mean, businesses and critical infrastructure face. And so one would argue that African nations must do the same. Uh, certainly, uh, we must note that the national security establishment must leverage AI's abilities to adaptively learn and detect novel patterns that can accelerate detection, containment, and response, because we must find ways to ease the burden on analysts so that they are much more um, uh, pro uh, proactive. You know, we have to make them um, and, and also more efficient. So the question then arises is where are we going? Um, I think three key areas that we need to look at. Uh, one is automated uh, warfare. Um, this certainly makes seems to make conflict much more precise, arguably re reducing civilian ca casualties. Uh, but I think the increased speed for decision-making or the narrowing of the time window for go-no-go -go type of decisions um, causes the human being not to be sufficiently reflective which can ra um, raise the error rate. And I think there was the famous story of the Russian uh, colonel during the Cold War. Uh, I think it was in 2000, no, 1997, who, uh, you know, the systems were telling him that there was um, some uh, uh, nuclear missiles had been launched from the US. And, um, you know, if it had been just an AI system, it would have, as programmed, automatically uh, probably launched a counteroffensive, and it turned out that you know uh, the systems actually were wrong, and so the human element there prevented that uh, nu uh, nuclear catastrophe. And so there are these um, errors that can arise due to incomplete data or wrong data, and also also the associated ethical concerns. And I think uh, again back to some of the things uh, Unkula had mentioned. Context-specific frameworks are possible, uh, are, are crucial. We need, need them. The second area of um, major concern in terms of where we are going uh, is in the range in the area of deepfakes and information warfare. Uh, we have seen uh, in 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 the case of Cambridge Analytica interference in elections in Kenya and in Nigeria uh, some years ago. So it's not that this is coming. This is Apparently happened, and so we can see the 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 specter of destabilization due to deepfakes and information uh, or misinformation campaigns. And when you think in terms of the liberal democracies that we are trying to build, excuse me, um, cruise missile costs approximately one point seven million dollars, and if you fire it, um, you know it can travel. I don't know. Two three thousand kilometers, and has an accuracy within one or two meters. So it, it can actually destroy a specific building at a specific time, which, from a military perspective, is very useful. But if you are able to hack through misinformation, uh, hate news, um, fake fake news, and uh, you know, um, on, on deep fakes and all of that, if you can hack the electorate so that they elect the wrong person as the commander in chief, president commander in chief. Um, I'm sure the national security operatives in our audience would appreciate that if your commander in chief tells you to go left, I doubt any one of you would actually go right. And um, you know, what would be the cost of that? I don't know, two, three hundred thousand dollars. So it is actually quite an effective, unfortunately, effective um, uh, mechanism. Uh, the third area, I think, in terms of where we are going um, that is of concern uh, uh, revolves around the issues of resource allocation. Uh, we need to be able to optimize the allocation of research uh, resources in terms of peacekeeping missions to make them uh, more effective and other national security, what I call preventative measures. But we must appreciate that uh, many of these platforms are extremely expensive, and so one actually has to really weigh, uh, you know, the, the cost effectiveness of 
uh, deploying some of these platforms vis-a-vis -vis some of the traditional platforms that already exist. And so just to, to, to again, build upon um, uh, the previous speaker's uh, notion, I also agree with her, and I believe that the digital revolution's ultimate legacy in national security will be determined not by technology, but how it is used. I think uh, I'll leave that there. Thank you very, very much, Abdul Akeem. Great series of points. You know, I think you're you're pointing out that in many respects, um, AI is already kind of driving armed conflict. So specifically, I think the the non-general purpose artificial intelligence that Nakthula mentioned through things like algorithms in our social media feeds that amplify disinformation or create deep fakes to unmanned systems that are increasingly deploying uh, AI-based image recognition for targeting purposes um, or to kind of detect and predict where targets might be, for example. So, so I think AI is already here right in a lot of ways. So I'd, I'd love your perspective, and this was actually just asked uh, in the chat, um, uh, regarding what needs to be done to ensure that uh, law enforcement tries to stay one step ahead of the potential harms being caused by the spread of novel technologies. You know, I've heard you uh, say before that, you know, law enforcement moves at the speed of light, um, technology moves uh, at the speed of law, excuse me, technology moves at the speed of light. So sorry if I stole some of your thunder there, but but more, more broadly, how, how should government and security sector actors address uh, the security challenges that are, are likely to, to stem from rapid advancements and spreading artificial intelligence? Ah, that's a good one. Um... Okay, can I just take a quick step back for a moment? Uh, and le let's ask the audience, just think about this. Uh, apart from things like chat GPT and BARD, how many of us actually have used AI? Um, and, you know, in, in your mind, just think about it. How many of us have used AI? And um, I, I would suspect that, again, apart from those um, uh, particular examples, not man many of us think we have not used AI. And so then I would now ask the question, how many of us have used the smartphone in uh, portrait mode? How many of us use Google Assistant, Alexa, Siri, Bixby? Um, how many of us um, have uh, watched, you know, Nigerian Nollywood movies that have a lot of drone uh, usage for filming and advanced uh, editing? How many of us use social media feeds? Uh, how many of us, you know, use Spotify, Netflix, YouTube, online video games, online ads network? Indeed, uh, to get to the location I am right now, I, I use Google Maps. You know, how many of us use Apple Maps for navigating uh, or for calling an Uber or for booking a flight ticket? You know, how many of us do online banking and finance? Or maybe at home we have a smart TV or fridge. Uh, again, how many of us, when we go to our office, we have to either use our thumbprint or, you know, face recognition, or indeed use our thumbprints or faces on, on our phones? And so when you think about that, let me ask the question in a slightly different way. Given the above, how many of us have not used AI? And so really um, AI is not coming to Africa. It's already here, it's with us. And so I think this is a, a, a key notion that we have to uh, keep in the back of our minds. Now back to uh, um, your, your, your question. I would suggest um, the government and security sector consider possibly the following, let's say four things. And again, to build on what uh, Nokula has said, regulatory frameworks, we must establish robust regulatory frameworks for ethical use of AI. I also think uh, you know, the, the security sector needs to engage much more, again, this might sound like an anathema, but in public-private partnerships to collaborate with the tech companies to accelerate the uh, adoption of AI. Uh, certainly, again, as the previous speaker had said, we need increased transparency and accountability. Uh, we need to be able to implement mechanisms that you know, ensure that AI systems are transparent and, 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 and accountable to humans. So the, the human has to be somewhere. And I think we do need, uh, again, it may sound strange for the national security community, but 
uh, more international cooperation. We need to engage, uh, you know, it, it, with the with with other countries, especially in our continent and our subregions, uh, with much more cooperation to ad address these challenges, uh, especially in the areas of you know cyber warfare and and the leveraging of of of, uh, of AI in modern warfare. So while AI has the potential to significantly impact peace and security across Africa, uh, I would advocate that it is imperative that ethical considerations and robust governance structures uh, guide its implementation. Uh, failure to do so could result in the technology causing much more harm uh, than good. I think I'll just leave that here. Thank you very, very much. Uh, that's a that's a great answer, um, particularly like the point that AI is already omnipresent and, you know, it's incumbent upon uh, us to think differently about employing AI. I mean, look at like the drone war in Ukraine, for example, right, where a lot of the funding for those drones is being crowdsourced by public-private partnerships with kind of loose linkages to the military, leveraging commercial office of health technology. I think that is clearly where a lot of defense technology is going, including the, the use of artificial intelligence in defense tech. So it's incumbent, I think, upon African governments and militaries to, to begin thinking about that. And so so I, I think you helped out. I had a really good answer about how to help our audience think about how to address the security challenges from like extremist groups or, or organized crime through AI. Um, I'd like to sort of ask the inverse of this question, which is, how do you think security sector actors should be actively harnessing AI? How can security sector actors kind of leverage the technical technical advances being driven by artificial intelligence to address some of the security threats that they're 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 facing, not just sort of respond to some of these harms that are being being driven by AI? Hmm. Okay. Well. Um, as I've noted earlier, AI is already having a significant impact on peace and security across Africa. And uh, I think its role is only likely to grow in the coming years. Uh, however, this growth will come with challenges that require proactive government and multi-stakeholder collaboration to ensure that AI is used again responsibly and ethically. Uh, so one of the areas that uh, I think is not only being used, but uh, I think we can consider uh, some expansion, is in the area of real-time analysis. Uh, certainly, AI is capable of analyzing vast amounts of data in real time, you know, enabling immediate decision making. Uh, we see, for example, in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, Huawei, uh, the Chinese company, has contributed to the development of an advanced uh, surveillance system. Uh, this system actually leverages or uses AI or leverages AI to analyze real-time data uh, during large public, public events, um, facilitating the identification of you know, potential security threats. Uh, again, as Ankosula has mentioned, uh, the issues uh, around natural language processing. Uh, so we can see AI-driven uh, natural language processing could, for example, monitor online chatter for signs of extremist uh, activities. And I think uh, it's Somalia, uh, AI algorithms are being used to monitor online forums for signs of uh, extremist recruitment, for example. Uh, also in the area of robotics, I, I know you talked about that very, you know, in, in your opening statement, but really AI powered robots can be used uh, on what we would call dangerous missions like bomb disposal. And so we see in Egypt, for example, bomb disposal robots equipped with AI uh, are used to at least disarm, I, I'm going to use the word safely, but at least to disarm explosives with minimal impact to, for example, uh, the operatives and, and the other human beings around. I think we've also seen, uh, or we can also see where AI will be used for simulation and training. Uh, you know, it can, AI can simulate various security scenarios uh, for training. And certainly, uh, we're seeing the rise of virtual reality simulations powered by AI that are being, for example, used to train uh, peacekeeping forces in Ethiopia. Uh, so these are some of the, 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 the things that I would look at. Now, uh, sadly, uh, I think AI uh, is actually also being used to develop killing machines or machines that can make decisions to kill or not kill. 
uh, and these are new machines of war. And so bluntly, all advanced nations are working on various kinds of autonomous systems from smart missiles and drones to tanks and guns, and, you know, and even a new generation of smart bullets that can quote unquote, go around corners. Um, and so we do have to ask ourselves who bears responsibilities for the mistakes of an AI system developed in one part of the world, but applied in another place that might have a totally different uh, environment in the broad sense. Uh, we should also note that, for example, 28 out of the 157 countries recently at the UN uh, who uh, are currently seeking to prohibit fully autonomous weapons uh, under the convention of conventional weapons. Um, notably, however, and again, with due respect to the, our hosts, uh, the United States, Russia, Israel, Australia, South Korea, um, and I think a few others, but at the core, these nations at the core, they are not willing to support negotiation uh, of a legally binding instrument to ensure meaningful human control over these crucial uh, functions of weapon systems. And I think another area of concern is, uh, you know, the, the lethal autonomous weapon systems that are AI powered uh, military systems that can now identify and engage targets without human intervention. And, uh, you know, as recently as in March 2020, uh, we saw the Libyan warlord, uh, Halifa Haftar, uh, his logistics units were actually attacked by, I think it was the Turkish made SDM Cargo 2 drones. And this was as they fled Tripoli. Uh, so, so, you know, this is on African soil. And these drones were programmed to attack targets without requiring data connectivity between the operator and uh, the targets. Um, you know, and so some people, you know, def uh, you know basically for many um, analysts, this effectively uh, makes them a lethal autonomous weapon system. And so while some experts may, may classify the cargo to drone as a loitering munition, Others would say it's a lethal autonomous weapon system. And so it's, it's use in combat in North Africa highlights, you know, the increased uh, deployment uh, and use of AI enabled weapons in our continent. And I believe, um, at least from what I've read, at least 12 African countries use uh, the Bacteria TB2 drones uh, across the African continent. And so, I mean, these things are here. Uh, it's, this is not a theory. It's not in some other part of the world. And so in the practice of politics, for example, cyber war and the deployment of AI in the battlefield. Um, and again, to build on you know, the, the previous speaker, we, we do need to establish some thresholds. And these thresholds can be established based on underlying philosophies. But in terms of some of these um, autonomous weapons that we've seen around the world, uh, there are two broad philosophies that uh, um, are observable. And again, this is a very broad brush, so forgive me. But generally speaking, uh, across the US, Europe, uh, Western Europe, um, their philosophy there seems to seek to eliminate false positives, uh, which means to err in favor of not killing innocents even if it means maybe one or two um, uh, bad actors might get through. Uh, when you move further east, uh, we're looking at Russia, China, uh, their philosophy uh, seems to seek to eliminate false negatives. And by implication, that is to err in not letting any potential threat through, but a few innocents might be sacrificed. And so, uh, for the decision makers, uh, strategic decision makers, and national security operatives across the African continent, we really need to ask ourselves, what is the African philosophy going to be? Because you need an underlying philosophy, you need to define your principles, not simply based on UNESCO principles, but I'm saying the African principles. We have some traditional ones already, community, transparency, respect for elders. <clears throat> uh, you know, things like that, collab collaboration. But we need to be able to understand what our philosophy will be, what our principles will be, what our ethics will be. Once we've determined those three platforms or pillars, 
it is on top of that that we now begin to uh, develop our policies, our strategies, our accountability frameworks, uh, which also must be rooted in our own cultural uh, and worldview. Um, and so I would request that many of the strategists uh, in the audience, especially those who are helping to develop future Africans, future generations of African strategists, um, try to lay these foundations uh, because once we have those foundations, policy, doctrine, strategy, uh, you know, and uh, subsequently operational tactics will follow. So very quickly, it's vital that African priorities are not vendor driven. Uh, for Africa to sustainably address uh, these and other challenges, again, we must define and protect African values uh, throughout that chain in all spheres, in all domains, articulate our cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, IoT and related uh, you know, technology, philosophies, ethics, principles, policies, and then the strategies that result or emanate from our culture and unique circumstances. Uh, let me leave it there, and then, uh, you know, uh, we, I'm sure we can continue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Abdul Hakim. And I, I'd just like to reinforce, I think, I think Abdul Hakim made an urgent call for the beginning of some African-owned principles towards ethical, responsible AI use in armed conflict and warfare under the, the logic that this isn't a hypothetical, this isn't something that's coming, this is something that has already happened, right? He, Abdul King referenced 2020 in Libya as an example where, by some definitions, lethal autonomous weapons are already being used. So I would, I would add, I'm not sure it's up for a future generation of strategists to do this. I think it's up for the strategists who are currently attending this webinar to begin thinking about this and, and taking this seriously. Um, so we now uh, uh, return to the, the begin the question and answer period. Um, I would encourage our participants to please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to begin to switch to submit your written questions for the panelists. You may submit them in any language that you like. Um, if you would like me to call you out by name, uh, bearing in mind this is a public webinar, please feel free to, to state your name before you write your question, uh, and I will, I will recognize you. Um, and as moderator, I will convey as many questions to the panelists as my time allows. Um, we already have three uh, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask to get us started, and hopefully there will be more populating the chat as we go forward. So first question is from an English speaker, um, you know, who is agreeing that that context specific laws are appropriate. Um, but I think wanting a little bit more clarity on what these laws should look like, um, what they should be. And, you know, in the absence of 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 uh, uh, context specific ideas, maybe shouldn't shouldn't isn't there some value in using existing regulations, be they UNESCO or, for example, the U.S. Defense Department actually did just recently release uh, some guidance on the ethical principles of using AI and armed conflict. So should those be a starting point and how should they be adapted to an African context based off of taking into considerations, you know, uh, uh, things like bias and AI, things like maybe different African philosophies that might exist surrounding what would and would not be acceptable around autonomous weapons use, et cetera. Um, so that's uh, uh, one question. Um, on a quelques autres questions en français que je voudrais vous poser. Uh, um, a question in French from a French speaker. We would like to know if we can speak, if you can really give a better definition of artificial intelligence. Can you delve deeper in terms of the different types of artificial intelligence? If you can give some concrete examples of artificial intelligence, uh, for example, image recognition. And also, how can states contribute to regulate the uh, elaboration development of uh, artificial intelligence in Africa? And 
in the continent where so many conflicts are uh, continuing to are endless, it would seem. So we're going to go to Abdullah mm -hmm. and then Abdullah uh, Abdullah, come on in. Uh, uh, you can answer any of those questions you like, and then we'll uh, we'll go to you, Abdullah Kim, and then we'll ask the next round. Uh, thanks, Nate. The first question um, regarding why we cannot use existing regulations right now to you know, regulate artificial intelligence, I would say we can. The, uh, the laws that are in place to a certain extent do help. I mean, things like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and how that you know, falls into or is incorporated to the rules in different countries, the laws in different countries are useful. The right to privacy you know, right now can be emphasized on issues regarding mass, uh, mass surveillance. Um, the right to freedom of expression can be used to address issues of, you know, um, creating echo chambers and AI being used to influence elections. Things like that. These laws that currently are useful, but they have to be adapted to address how AI is changing what we know. It, 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 it's shifting our per perception, our perspective, and so how we approach the existing laws should also be different. We cannot, you know, it's, you know, we, can't, uh, we can't approach it from a black and white perspective. We have to look at the gray areas, you know, of applying laws because AI is in a regulatory gray area. And that's why, for instance, um, I use a recent example of lawyers using chat GPT for their legal pleadings and referencing cases that did not exist. And luckily the law, um, the judges, and I emphasize the humans, were able to pick up on this and admonish the lawyers for using chat GPT indiscriminately, for not checking and triple checking their work. But there you can see a law that exists or uh, you know, a regulation or form of governance that exists, meaning that lawyers are to do their due diligence. And so, you know, judges hold them to account. So now AI has joined the mix and grayed the area out. And a judge cannot necessarily say, uh, use of chat GPT will be banned in my courtroom. But a judge can say that use of chat GPT can be disclosed in my courtroom things of that nature. So we have some tools available right now through the laws that exist right now, but we need to make those laws better. We need to, you know, concretize some of these laws within principles that are based in the African context, like Mr. Jijala, you know, emphasized. That is how, you know, one can address something like, rather than wait for laws to come up, let's use what we have and then adapt that for the future into something better. Now, the second question asked for a better definition of artificial intelligence. I go back to my opening statement. There is no agreed upon definition of AI. It is simply the replication or the attempt to replicate human intelligence. But again, you know, my fellow panelists mentioned that uh, actually it's, it's glorified data analysis. But if we sit with, you know, the definition that was offered from the very beginning, meaning computers trying to replicate human actions, human decision making, how the brain works, that is what we have to go from right now. And I mentioned again that, you know, even legislators, even policymakers are struggling, you know, because of that very fact. And so what happens now is, and to go back to the first question is they a lot of countries have chosen to adopt a risk based approach meaning the higher uh, the implications are for ai causing harm the more it should be regulated so coming back to you know our focus or topical point for you know autonomous weapons autonomous weapons have the implications of life and death judicial decision makings for, for all intents and purposes, have the implications of life and death. So before AI is introduced into these spaces, into spaces of service delivery and, you know, the environment, 
one has to hold these, these, these tools and these systems to a higher standard than one would hold the tool or the system in something that does not have implications that result in either life and death and that decision being made by a system without a human being to take accountability. But in terms of broad categories of artificial intelligence, I mentioned you have narrow AI. Narrow AI is what we've been seeing quite recently in terms of um, you know, chatbots, in terms of what we see or what you're using on Netflix, on Spotify, on the examples that you know, Mr. Ajijala mentioned, that is narrow artificial intelligence. Then you have generative AI. Now, this is AI that has been, I want to use the word, I can't, it's on the tip of my tongue, but amended. AI that has the ability to think to a certain extent, you know, limited thinking. And I use this very, very loosely, the thinking aspect, but it's been trained on data that allows it to reach a decision based on past data. Generative AI, the ability to ask ChatGPT a question and have it come up with an answer because it has learned from questions that have been asked in the past. I mean, even when you think of robotics, robotics falls under narrow AI right now because let's think of Sophia, the example I used of Sophia. If you ask Sophia a certain question, you know, she, she wouldn't really give you the answer that you're looking for. Um, I think an example was she was asked, how old are you? And the response was a lady never tells, right? <laughs> And, and in that sense, it, you know, it's, it's, it's AI that's still narrow. It's tra being trained on data that exists right now. But generative AI is, you know, AI that's able to use machine learning, deep learning, replicate to a higher extent how the human brain works. But it has its limitation. And then finally, you now have super intelligence. And this is what you see or we would see on, on, on TV shows and, and series and I robot and you know an an AI that has nuance and can exercise emotional intelligence and can think for itself and make decisions on its own. But right now we are currently in a space between narrow artificial intelligence and generative artificial intelligence. And it all goes back to how much computing power we have right now as a society in the world, how much data is being generated. And how the you know the increase of the internet is is influencing how AI tools are able to learn, replicate, analyze the data, things of that nature. Uh, I'll stop there, Nate. Uh, Great, thanks, Abdul Hakim. Over to you. Mm, uh, still on mute. I think that's the, the COVID era signal. <laughs> uh, but very quickly, um, leveraging you know frameworks from places like UNESCO or the US Department of Defense, but in of itself is not a problem. And uh, of course, it's a good idea to give you the basis for consideration. But I think the key takeaway is that uh, Africans need to have their independent thinking uh, on these matters. Um, in terms of um, AI definition, I'd like to take you through a slightly different um, way of looking at this. Uh, first and foremost, all questions of technology, arguably, um, are answered or dictated by culture, which arises from our, your circumstances. So, for example, uh, our parents, grandparents in Africa uh, wanted to cut wood in the forest. And so that, that required that we develop machetes, which uh, leverage uh, physics that pressure is in, inversely proportional to surface area. So if you make one side of the cutlass very thin and it strikes the wood, it cuts. Um, this impacts our uh, thinking in terms of technology transfer as the culture that generates specific technologies may be very different from the culture and circumstances where they are being applied. And this is very much the case in AI and, and, you know, and, and across the digital realm. Now, when we look at the computer as you know it or we know it today, uh, i.e. the processor that's in the computer, that's the real component, uh, that's really arguably the first tool made by mankind uh, in which the maker really doesn't determine its use because it's a general purpose hardware. Uh, what is 
what it does is determined by the software. So you can use it for a spreadsheet. Another software makes it work for a word processor or an, another one might allow it to be a data, uh, keep data database. And so uh, what it does is really determined by the maker of the software. That is what the general purpose processor does uh, is determined by the maker of the software and the, the buyer of the tools can now ubiquitously develop their own software. However, what has happened, and we're now coming to AI here, the software itself has moved from being a fixed purpose software, again, like a spreadsheet, to a general purpose, uh, through a new generation of general purpose software using learning algorithms, otherwise known as AI or artificial intelligence, whose behavior depends on the data being fed. Um, what does this do? Well, so algorithms arguably per se are not biased, but the data we feed and train them is biased. Now, compounding this, we are now seeing AI that can now write its own computer code and rejig algorithms. This is the worrisome part. And um, because this raises the specter of a profound loss of human control of technology in which humanity, especially Africa, needs to come to grips with quite quickly. And so the data used to train most AI systems are not indigenous to Africa. Two, the algorithms may have been, for example, developed for medical, and we are now using it in you know, autonomous vehicles or killing machines. And so we need to look at what should Africa's position be. Quite frankly, uh, if I may use uh, an analogy, beyond the battlefield, we should ask ourselves, who bears liability for an AI-driven vehicle? Traditionally, it was the driver's liability in the Vienna Convention on Road Traffic. I think that was 1968 and amended in the 90s, because that provides a legal uh, and ethical definition of a driver and driving. But we've seen that in addition to that, there are significant uh, privacy concerns as an AI controlled car broadcasts significant amounts of information in real time. And we've seen, for example, where the US military wanted some of its um, soldiers overseas, you know, to stay fit and, you know, they, 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 they have to run around a, a track. And suddenly the Fitbit data, which was now made publicly available, you were seeing these circles uh, uh, of tracks, you know, in the middle of nowhere, secret uh, US bases in Niger or, you know, uh, in, in, in other parts of the continent. And so, the questions really we need to ask ourselves, what happens to all this data? How long will it be stored? Who will have access to it? And again, another example is from uh, a, a situation where crashed and damaged Tesla cars that, that were damaged in America were sold for scrap and ended up in Eastern Europe. But the US citizens data was still in the cars because the processor and the memory was still intact. And so this also brings us to the challenges of these kind of AI driven platforms, uh, forcing us to wonder, can we actually trust, you know, the Teslas, the Googles, the Chryslers uh, to adapt to self-regulation? I'm not even talking about African regulators here. And so I think um, it's imperative that Africa's current and middle level, you know, the security operatives and hopefully many who are listening in on today and as well as civil society and ac academia, appreciate that you know you are that generation, and I, I take my correction from uh, Nate's observation. You are that generation that will determine and lay the foundations of that philosophy, policy, uh, strategy, ethics frameworks rooted in our culture and our worldview, so that you know, as I said, future African strategies will follow. So I, I've not given you types or examples, but I hope I've given you know this trend of how. AI, quote unquote, it's rooted in, for example, Southern California thinking and technology uh, and may not necessarily fit congruently in the African context. And we, we do have to factor that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try for one, maybe two more rounds of questions. Sorry if we don't get to yours. We have some really excellent questions that have been asked in the chat. Um, keep them coming. So three more. Um, one from Colonel Simon Mina of Kenya, uh, who asks the dual use and capabilities of AI 
make it hard for security strategists to restrict the adoption of this technology to alleviate harm. Uh, you know, lawbreakers ignore existing regulations and values. And, you know, how how is it? I think the question is, how do you effectively mitigate the harm if a lot of the technology that is being used is actually civilian and dual purpose use, given the importance that we talked about earlier, right, of, of public and, and private sector, uh, uh, both public and private sector in developing and using AI that a lot of weapons technology is is from commercial off the shelf products, which which kind of seems to me, I think it absolutely right, poses a whole different kind of scale of, of regulatory challenges as a, as a security sector actor. Um, a second kind of series of questions, which is, uh, how do we get uh, African states to invest uh, AI, right? Um, I think as, as you both have alluded to, a lot of the AI that we use comes from algorithms that are trained primarily using data developed in other countries. So given the, the many, many other demands for development, for education, for shelter, for security, um, you know, does it make sense for African governments to invest in AI when I think training these algorithms is really, really expensive, billions and billions of dollars? And how how ready is Africa to develop its own AI within this context, right? What does what Africa-owned AI look like? I think another really, really great question. And then finally, we have a couple of different questions focused around the use of AI um, in, in uh, education. Um, one uh, comes from uh, Zeta Freitas from, from Cape Verde, just wanting to, to understand the AI impact of education more broadly. I think since we're focusing a little bit on security here, I'd be curious to hear both of your perspectives so specifically on how, what impact AI might be having on uh, security and, and military education or, or technology education in terms of, I guess, people using chat GPT or kind of one one challenge I've, I've thought about is, you know, actually a lot of the work that security forces do is is writing, right? Either you're writing orders or, you know, you're, 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 you're writing strategy. So what, what types of, of uses does AI have for those types of educational purposes as well? Um, let's start with you, Abdul Akim, and then we'll go uh, to Nokthula, and we'll see if we have time for one more round of, of questions after that. Um, I think, um, then with due respect, um, when you, when, national security of, operatives by nature, um, I think unduly gravitate to restrict. Um, you can't restrict it. Um, if I may ask, how many of us have used Google Maps? Now, for those of you who have used Google Maps, when you're going along the road and the road is free, I mean, you know, the, the, there's little traffic, uh, the color of the road on your map is either blue or green. Um, when you now encounter a little traffic, um, the color of your map turns to orange. And when you get to, you know, chock -a block where traffic literally stops, uh, the color of your road goes to red. How is that possible? Well, what happens is that your, the phones of the people ahead of you are leaking data. And because they're leaking data, the AI algorithm of Google Maps is able to make these interpretations. But you must understand the implication here. The implication is that your phone is leaking data to the guy or the person behind you. And so are you going to restrict the use of phones and uh, you know, basically 3G and above? Uh, I don't think that's, that's gonna happen. So what do we need to do? I think we do need to create a high level of awareness and we do need to build the human capital from our vast human resources to be able to basically um, manage these things, uh, to be able to make sure that even if the data is leaking from your handset, uh, how much of it is leaking to, through your networks that use um, foreign technologies to other countries? I don't know if, if you know this, but at least 70% of all mobile networks in Africa, if not more, are actually you know, sourced from a single country, China. Um, and at least 80 or so percent of all you know, mobile handsets 
again, uh, a source from one, this, this, you know, one and the same country. And so the question is, how can we have the capacity to develop our own platforms, not necessarily developing the networks, but developing those platforms that will help us to detect what data is being leaked to where and thereby block that leakage. Um, on, on the question of um, the investment, um, clearly we do need to uh, invest and we, we, we need to be able to look at um, it clearly as an investment, not necessarily an expense. And if I may uh, give you an example more from cybersecurity as opposed to uh, AI, um, there are analysts that predict that or project that in the next 10 to 15 years, um, the African, I mean, in the next 10 years, African cybersecurity solutions market, which has a lot of AI vested, um, is going to be anywhere between 15 and $30 billion US. Now, this may be small by global standards, but the point is with a 30 or 15 or $30 billion market for in Africa, that is an opportunity for job creation, wealth generation, taxes, because you're gonna to have to buy these um, uh, solutions anyway. And so Africa must make a decision. Is it going to uh, be a foreign exchange gain or a foreign exchange drain? And so the other thing is that where to start, uh, and, and Nate, I would just like to disagree slightly with you. Uh, in terms of algorithms, I think this is where we need to start. And actually algorithms are logic and mathematics. They don't even need a computer to begin with. And so these are the kind of things we need to start with. Um, we already produce, as I gave with the Google Maps example, a lot of data in Africa. We simply do not collect, we simply do not harness it. We simply do not utilize it. We do not channel it to our own benefit. So I think we do need to look at those kind of investments and understand that the horse has already left the barn. It has already bolted. The question is, how are we going to best manage it? It's not about restriction. That, that, that's gone. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Abdul Kim. Great series of answers. Um, we'll go now to Nakthula. Maybe we'll have, I think this might be the final word. I also ask you maybe to, to specifically weigh in on the question of uh, Africa-owned AI. Um, my understanding of how AI algorithms are developed is through machine learning, right? Or a lot of them. And that that actually is like a very intensive and, and expensive uh, process, even though once the algorithms are developed, they're kind of widely accessible and easy to use. But I have no clue. I think between the three of us, you are the certified AI researcher and expert. So I'd, I'd love for you to kind of weigh in specifically on that topic, as well as some of the more general questions that have been have been asked. Um, yes, thank you. I agree with what um, Mr. Ajijala just mentioned in the sense that the foundational elements of algorithms is based in mathematics and statistics. And, you know, it also brings into question the importance of collaboration because more often than not, a lot of countries, especially in Africa, have existed in this you know, siloed or fragmented space. And AI is pushing us out of that space, pushing us out of our comfort zones. And it also ties into the question of you know, mitigation rather than restriction. Um, in as much as the security strategists in the room you know, want to take up the mantle and take up the call, I think you know, we should all be delving into the knowledge that exists in our you know, counterparts who are in computer science. Counterparts who've been studying this for the past you know, 50 plus years, you know, for, for, for lack of a better. So it requires a lot of collaboration. It requires having the people who are experts in the field explain how to make the particular tool or the system better, explain that the loopholes that are created in a particular system that you know either further the risks or mitigate the risks or make the risks better. But essentially, we need to collaborate with computer scientists to take us from the grassroots level of understanding how an algorithm works and how that you know moves on to 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 systems of machine learning and how it moves on to the social impacts that we see 
around us. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I think, you know, Mr. Jigala covered a lot, but I will talk about the impact of artificial intelligence in terms of education. And the, 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 the default reflex is again, restriction, saying that, you know what, the use of AI in education should not be allowed, but it's here. The horse has left the barn. So how can we direct this horse in a way that we still emphasize the need for, you know, human interaction, uh, human intelligence at work, but still have tools that enhance these conversations. For education in particular, for those who are teaching in academia, the biggest issue so far has been students um, submitting assignments and, and answering questions that GPT has answered for them. Now, the, 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 the default reflex is to fail the student and tell this the student is, you know, has no ability to think independently. The student, you know, will not move further unless they can think for themselves. But there are other solutions in terms of mitigation. One such solution that, you know, I've seen currently is disclosure. The disclosure that when AI has been thrown in the mix of things, it is disclosed and the extent to which it falls or it has been used. Now in security, while collecting intelligence on a particular matter, you know, is the security specialist in that you know, particular country disclosing to his or her superiors or you know, whoever is in charge that in the collection of this information, we relied heavily and to, certain, to a certain extent on AI for A, B, C, and D. It allows an open space. It allows the transparent space to explain why did you choose to rely on this particular tool for this? What are the implications on relying on this tool for that, you know, for this reason or the other? So we should not just be quick to throw it out, throw the baby out of the bathwater. We should look at ways in which we can use this for the benefit of, you know, our countries or our continent and protect that which we hold close. So I think I've answered that in terms of, you know, the AI impact on education. And I really want to emphasize how it is important for African countries to use the data that we generate. It's moving you know, to other countries, it's being used by the alphabet companies, but how do we use it to protect our privacy, to protect our right to human dignity, to, to enhance the, the bread and butter issues that are being faced by people in our communities, in our sectors, and we know that our information is not available because if we look at the indexes that are coming out, you, it's so difficult to find information on Africa. So we need to use our data. We need to, to use the AI systems and we need to develop and use incentivize people to create tools in Africa for Africans. And whether this is included in legislation and in policy remains to be seen. But I really believe that we should include incentivizing and, you know, creating subsidies for, for African scientists and computer scientists or whatever it may be to create tools that are used for Africans in Africa, subject to African principles. I'll stop there, Nick. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And allow me on behalf of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies to thank our wonderful panelists for their insights and our participants for their excellent questions. Um, uh, just kind of three quick takeaways before we conclude. Um, one major takeaway for me, um, AI isn't coming to Africa. It's already here. It's been here for a while. Um, as Nakthula explained very early on, and I think as Abdul Akim showed in some very concrete examples, it's in the phones that you use, it's in the maps that we're using, it's in the social media networks that you're being a part of. For government and security actors, it is increasingly in the weapon systems that you are relying on, um, be they be it bought from other countries or, or developed uh, in, internally. Um, and the, the degree to which we all rely on depend on AI systems, be they image recognition systems, um, language processing systems that we chat with, um, or decision-making systems of various kinds, is only likely to grow and increase in the future. Um, number two, like with most technologies, um, AI is neither good nor bad, and 
the main reason why we are in the present moment that we're in is, as Nakthula said at the very beginning, um, there is a scare being caused by the harms we're already seeing being driven by AI, be it sort of the unchecked spread of disinformation, um, kind of the, the use of autonomous weapon systems without uh, necessarily a kind of legal frameworks in place that, that, that very clearly kind of define their use or have discussions about as stuff. Abu Akeem was saying, potentially banning them all altogether, um, you know, violations of privacy, exploitations of human rights. And, you know, third, uh, and I think perhaps most importantly, is that this isn't, because this isn't a hypothetical, it's really up to all of the strategists listening in on today's conversation to come up with regulations, laws, strategies, doctrine, uh, to use them that are informed by, you know, ethical principles, ideas, goals, and objectives that are African, but but also specific to your country and, and region. And I think while there is a lot of, of, of tools that can be seen as useful starting points, we mentioned uh, UNESCO's AI doctrine, uh, we mentioned the African Union's in the middle of, of writing a continental ethical AI strategy. Uh, the U.S. Department of Defense has actually very recently published some general guidelines and principles for the ethical use of AI. Um, AI philosophy needs to be informed by African ethics, as, as uh, Abdul Hakim says, and we need to develop AI tools in Africa for Africans, as Nakthula says, as Nakthula said. And this is going to require thinking and, and I think some new ways of thinking, you know, be they public private partnerships, be they, you know, military institutions getting really, uh, really understanding the underlying technology and fostering partnerships with computer scientists and the private sector to come up with guidelines and ethics that I think as as both Makhul and Abdul Hakim said, mitigated the harms. I think it's not a question of banning. It's impossible to, to ban uh, AI or AI algorithms because it, they're already so omnipresent. But I think, you know, mitigation and transparency and accountability are probably going to be key themes regarding ethical and responsible use of AI going forward.